We're learning Likutei Sichos, Volume 1, Parshas Kedoshim. We're at page 245 in the Hebrew, Chapter 10. What we finished with in Chapter 9 was that the type of light, the type of revelation of God that is required for the redemption is at a different level than what was at the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai. So even though the Torah is not going to be changed ever, because there's only going to be one giving of Torah, and it was 2,900, uh, whatever, 3,333 years ago, the revelation of Hashem is going to intensify. And the description is that the light, meaning the revelation, is going to be such that it's not limited by the world. Right? Limited by the world, and clothed within the world itself. But the type of revelation that's talked about regarding the future redemption is what we call not imbued, not enclosed, but rather what we call hashra'ah. We call it... Um, no, not reflection. You can be imbued within something, and then you are within... Um, uh, sorry, the, the light, the revelation of Hashem is imbued and clothed within the person. And that's what Torah does. But you can go one step further. It's, it's Torah of our world. That's what it does. Which is called Hashra'a. Hashra'a usually is translated as inspiration. But it doesn't mean inspiration. It means to be immersed within. So instead of the... You can say it's almost a switch. Then instead of the light being within you, you're immersed within the light. And so it becomes... Um, that's why a lot of times it's described as it is the sudden revelation of the surrounding light. But what it means to say is that this light is everywhere. It has no limits. Light that, revelation of God that is built for the worlds is such that it will only come into wherever is ready for it. Whatever is a ready vessel. So if you're a ready vessel, so you have high... Um, sensitivity and the sensitivity allows the light to come in and you're not broken from it usually but once the light becomes the you're immersed within it it doesn't care whether you're a vessel or you not become a I don't know if you become a transmitter but you, you become there's no there's no holds there's nothing there's no limits at all so whether you're ready or not you're in a full immersion experience and, and you're catapulted into it suddenly. And whether you've prepared yourself or not, it doesn't matter. And you're going to get the full, the full spectrum of divine revelation. So that's why it's so important to prepare. And the only way you can prepare for it, at least partially, is through Torah and mitzvahs. So says the Rebbe, so when we want to um, bring that light in, so really, even Torah and mitzvahs is not enough. Rather, what does he say? You have to do kadeshat mechaba mutar lecha. You have to sanctify yourself in those things that are permissible. Because what is a permissible? I guess permissible is almost like immersible. <laughs> that which is permissible is what you're immersed in anyway in your life. It's the regular habits of your life. The universal conduct that, that you and every other human being have. That's, that's what's going to show itself as godly. So if you're not doing this already, you won't be ready for it. But that's not what he dwells on in here. Here he dwells on the fact that you're bringing it by preparing for it. By sanctifying those things that you're immersed in normally, you sanctifying them, that's the way to bring that revelation into the world. You follow, right? This is, this is the... Th what? Everybody does. We said in Pesach, we all did that. We all took the regular things that we eat, and we said, we're going to sanctify ourselves with those things that are permissible. Okay. So, we eat matzah, but we don't let any of the uh, matzah touch anything liquid. At all. Why? It's not an iser. Cut. Because this is what it means to sanctify yourself. It's a, it's a tremendous uh, we, we Everybody eats uh, vegetables. We only eat vegetables you can peel. Why? Is there something wrong with a the vegetable? <laughs> There's chametz on the outside. 
There's no chametz on the outside. It's nonsense. So why do you? Why do we do that? Because it's sanctifying yourselves with what's permissible. You don't have to do. If somebody doesn't want to do it, don't do it. I won't come eat there. But that's the way it is on Pesach. Everybody has their own chumras. Everybody sanctifies their space the way they want to. And we do it with, with food. You have how you dress. Okay? So you have to wear a shirt, you have to wear pants. No, nothing says it has to be a white shirt, nothing says it has to be black pants. So why do you do it? Because I want to sanctify myself in what's permissible. In the, th- in the regular things of, of life, everybody has a beard. Well, something grows by everyone. I don't touch it. Why? Because I want to sanctify myself. You don't have to. The person wants to trim his beard. The so Allah says it's perfectly, perfectly okay. There's no problem with it. Why don't Hasidim trim their beards? Because it's sanctifying yourself with what's permissible. All these things, they prepare your space. They prepare the, 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 the air that you live in to be ready for this revelation of Hashem, which will be of the same type. It won't be a revelation inside anymore. It's not that Hashem is going to appear inside of you based on what you've prepared. It's going to be a full immersion experience. Anywhere you look, it's a, it's, in that sense, it's like, it's like the giving of the Torah. The, wherever they looked, they heard, in whatever direction they pointed their ears, they heard, they heard the same Ten Commandments being said. It didn't matter where you were looking. You could hear it from the rock, you could hear it from the air, you could hear it from the water, wh- wherever you were. But there it was very limited. It was just these words. And it was still so strong that it caused their neshama, their soul, to part their body. And here you can begin to imagine, we've, se- we've seen this, discussed in Chassidus. Yavo b'me'arot uvanikot mipachad Hashem tzvokot. Everybody will flee, will try to flee because of this fear, the sudden awe of what it means that everything is divine. It's a, it's a scary uh, experience. I don't know if you get used to it. What? Do they overcome Tuma? They become Tuma. They will die, right? I don't know if it was death in that sense. 10, chapter 10. So in relation to man, how is sanctifying yourself and those things that are permissible greater than keeping Torah and mitzvot? When a person is keeping Torah and mitzvot, he's still a separate being. He has a separate existence, separate from the Torah and mitzvot even. Like we said, that he forces, he coerces himself to follow God's divine will. But it's will. That's all he's doing. He's just coercing his will. So therefore, it is only what we call relatively external, an external experience. Because it's not touching upon his essence. But when a person is sanctifying himself in those things that are permissible for him, these things that belong to him, the world is his oyster, everything belongs to him. And yet, he... How do you say Poresh? I couldn't say it. He separates himself. Okay, it's good enough. He separates himself from them. He, he confines himself. He, he limits his involvement with these things, even though they're permissible. In that sense, he's removing his being, his separate being. He's taking it away, because this is his. And yet he's nullifying that. Therefore, that type of conduct is affecting the very essence, the very substance of his soul. This is also understood in relation to the verse in our parsha, last week's parsha, or if you're in America, this week's parsha, that you should be sanctified for me, which is similar to what the Mechilta, the Medrash of the Tanaic sages, of the Shnei sages on the, on the Torah, says about the verse, and you should be for me a Sgula, 
You should be for me a special nation. שתהיו כנועים לי, עוסקים בתורה ולא תהיו עוסקים בדברים אחרים. You should be my property, as it were. Engaging in Torah and not engaging in other things. That your business is Torah. על ידי כך שאין אדם כל מגע עם עניינים פרטיים שלו, כי גם הדברים המותרים אינם שלו, כי עם קדושה, הרי הוא בכלל כנועים לי, כל מציאותו נעשית אלוקות. When a person limits his contact with his personal affairs, and treats even those things that are permissible to him as, as, as if they're not his. They're off limits. And instead, he en- then he's called Kanui. Then he's called it like Hashem purchased him. It's like Av- Hashem has five Kinyanim in the world. We're going to read in Pirkei Avos, chapter 5 or 6. Avram is the first. First is Shemaim Valitz. But then Avram. Why is Avram a Kinyan? Why is he a call it a, 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 someone that belongs to God, because he had no personal business. His business is in time, didn't do anything else. He spent his entire life talking to people and convincing them that they should follow God and not follow some idolatry. By working with his own substance, a person is bringing down, is taking also the substance from above, meaning the revelation of God's substance, as it were. And everything that is His substance becomes the divine substance. And so the sages say in the Talmud that in the future the tzaddikim will be called holy just as God is called holy. So when you say the holy blessed one, you won't know. Are you talking about the tzaddik or are you talking about Hashem? Chapter 11. shel kadesh Now in relation to the type of service that's being done, the, the act of sanctifying yourself, but those things are permissible for you, is greater than the regular keeping of Torah and mitzvot in the following way. Again, this is re- referring to the type of service. Before the Torah, the sages also kept the mitzvot. How did they keep the mitzvot? They weren't commanded to. So there's different explanations. The, the, the Gemara says in Dharm, I believe, that Avram's uh, kidneys became like his rabbis. Meaning, in other words, that he knew it in the same way that you know how your kidneys function. Does anybody feel their kidneys functioning? No. If they're healthy, nobody knows what, where, they don't even know where they are. They're somewhere in there, they're doing their job. And that's the type of, of knowledge of God, of, of, of Torah. <laughs> sorry, of commandments that Avram had during his life. Another way to explain it even better. Intrinsic understanding. And it's the same way that you know that one plus one equals two. Yeah. Yeah. Most people know that, even if they're never taught it. And they know. Why? Because the mind knows that. Why does it know it? Because that's what happens to the mind when it grows up. Avram's mind grew up, and he knew Torah, he knew the mitzvos, not the Torah itself, not the text, of course, but he knew the mitzvos in the same way that a person knows that one plus one equals two. In the same way that you know that if you have something stuck in your teeth, you got to get it out. It's, it's not comfortable. That's how we know it. Because it's completely, immer- his, his mind is just filled with that knowledge. But because of that, the mitzvahs that they kept were spiritual. Because they were not commanded by God, so these commandments that they kept were sort of like uh, taking out something from between your teeth. It may be necessary, it may be good, but it doesn't leave an impression on the world. Not, nothing happened. Uh, the world didn't change because you took something out of your teeth. In the same way, the world didn't change because they kept a mitzvah. So for them, the tefillin, like by Yaakov, could be anything he was doing that day. So that day he was carving uh, little signs, little marks in, in pieces of wood. Okay, so that was his tefillin. 
What does it mean? That his mind was was such a, like like one plus one equals two, and I'm not I'm not even counting oranges. I'm just thinking about it. So he was he, so it was performed in a certain sense because the mind's performing it, but there's something missing. There's no action involved, and even if there's action, the action is not particular. It could be anything. It could be any action. Is is is, is an example of that. Time of the valley dua. Me'achal, the reason for this, says the Rebbe, is known. Me'achal she'avodat ha'avot higiyah l'rak l'shorish ha'bri'a adayim v'gid l'rak b'la'am, u'v'an sh'ruchaniyot, it's a kli yoter ma'ashir ha'gashmiyot. Because, this is a tough sentence, but he's saying that because their service was spiritual in its nature, why was it spiritual in its nature? Because all they reached was what we call the root of the world of creation. The root of the world of creation is such that it's thought. The world of creation is thought. So the, the world of creation is Bria. Bria is thought. Bria is Bina. It's all thought. Yeah, okay. So they could only get to that root. The root of the, of the, of the world of creation is Malchus Datsilus. That's the root. That's really the root of it. That's as far as they could get to. Because of that, because they couldn't get to, i say in another way, that up to Bria, up to creation, all the prophets saw all the way up there. And when you see all the way up there, what you see is images. Some type of image, some, some type of representation of what God wants. You can't see the actual act. All you can see is a representation of it. That's why all the prophets are described as seeing through a transparent pain. They see something, but it's a representation. It's almost like a mirrored image that represents, it's like going through a filter. It represents what's on the other side. But they can't come in touch. They can't see what's really on the other side. So if all you have is a representation, the best vessel for a representation is a spiritual act. Okay. What do we mean? The painting. The painting is abstract. And he comes and says, oh, this is my Uncle George. So you tell him, uh, sorry, you didn't understand the painting. <laughs> the painting is a representation of something. It's abstract. You can't say it's a representation of my Uncle George. Because that doesn't mean anything. Oh, the, 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 the artist was thinking about this, he was thinking about that, and all their interpretations, and it's like this, and it's like that. You can write whole books about it. It's a really good painting. You get, you get volumes of books, and, it, and it's famous, and it costs millions of dollars. But that's all a representation of, of, of something in reality. We don't know what the something in reality was, and it's not the point. If you if you think it's if if you're looking at what does this represent in reality, you miss the point of the painting. That's how the other prophets saw, and that's how Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov saw godliness. They saw God's will in that way. They could only see a representation of it. And so you only have a representation. You should write spiritual books, and that's what they did. Right? Matan Torah by Moshe Rabbeinu is something completely different. Moshe Rabbeinu says this is the thing that God said. He's not an abstract painter. He's a photographer. He brings exactly what God's will is. God was talking about a donkey and a cow and this is what he wants you to do with them. It's a completely different level of prophecy. Okay, but it's very important to know why their spiritual understanding was a... was the right vessel for the type of prophecy they had. And so they couldn't do a mitzvah the way we can do a mitzvah. They couldn't put tzitzis on because they didn't know. And it was just a, our thing. What we, what we do is the thing itself. We have a whole problem. Because when Moshe Rabbeinu took the photograph, he just gave the name under the photograph. He didn't leave us a photograph. When we're talking about a tzitzis, when we're talking about filling. He didn't leave us a, He didn't write in the book this, he didn't write like how you make the vessels in the tabernacle. He didn't say it has to be this width, that size, and this is what's written inside, and the, all, that, all that's missing. How do we know that? 
said it because there were people with Moshe Rabbeinu when he made the first fill-in, and he, said, he saw what he did. So he had the photograph in his head. He said, this is what you do. This is what God wants you to do. So that's how we know. We call it Halachal and Moshe Messina. That's what we do in the end. But by most other things, we have an actual description. By the tabernacle, we certainly have an actual description. And so on. Okay? So what about Matan Torah? But by Matan Torah it says, I, I Anochi, I. And that is an acronym for I have given myself, I have written myself into the Torah. That God gives us his substance, as it were. So when he gives his own substance, you don't need spirituality to interpret it. It's not the spiritual interpretation that you're looking for. What are you looking for? For the actual physical conduct that is supposed to come out of these words. Why is that, he says? Because the higher something is, the lower it comes down. And because it could come down so low, it can come down into the physical. Until now, it was only spiritual. By the, by the patriarchs, it was only spiritual because they didn't see so far up. They could only see up to the root of the world of creation. But once you see into the world of Atzilus, when you see, once you see into the world of emanation, and beyond, like Moshe Rabbeinu did, then you can bring it all the way down to the physical embodiment of what this mitzvah is, of what God's will is. Bechozot regam Still, as we've been saying, with the giving of the Torah, Hashem limited His revelation, the revelation of His substance, his substance only to the mitzvot, only to the commandments. You can't say that when you make a table, so the table is an example of God's substance. It's not. Ah, if you make a table in the tabernacle, which is a mitzvah, that is a revelation of his substance. So he's limited. He's limited only to the Torah, to whatever the Torah covers. So that's a limitation. Like we said, so the halacha says that you need to stand before someone who's performing a mitzvah. What are you standing up because of? You're not standing up because of the person. You're standing up because of the embodiment, the enclothement of God's will within that person right now. That's what we talked about before, that the highest revelation we have in this reality is called enclothement. It's called hitlapshut. This is only when a person is performing a mitzvah. He stops performing a mitzvah. You don't have to stand up in front of him because he's not holy himself. It's only God's will that's within him that was holy. But when a person is just walking around, you don't have to get up because it's not the image of God within him that, that matters. We're looking for the will, the will of God. Okay. In the future, there won't be any limitation like this. Right? What, what's going to happen? That even the permissible things will reveal godliness. And everything will reveal godliness. Godliness will be seen everywhere, in everything. The fact that God is not void of anything, nothing is void of God, there's no space that's empty of Him, and there is nothing but Him, will be revealed. That's the future revelation. Okay, so we explained it, I think, pretty well today. And that's called full immersion. That's called hashra'a in Chassidus. And full immersion is a whole different story. So if we already have all the mitzvahs, then we know everything. Say, say again? If we have the mitzvahs, all we have to do is keep the mitzvahs, and then we're on the same level as Moshe Rabbeinu. Yeah, but that's not the level of Mashiach. That's the whole point. That even Moshe Rabbeinu is, is brought down a limited revelation. It's not that that will change. That will stay the same. But the revelation that's, that's about to appear, the, this full immersion experience, is a completely different game. It's just something entirely different. What are you doing about... <coughs> so we're going to learn tomorrow. <coughs>